Will you please join me for the call to worship? People of God, we gather today striving to become a community that shows God's love to an often unlovable world. A love that is offered to all unconditionally. A love that feels the hungry and welcomes the stranger. And love that shines through all of us, allowing to be the face of Christ in all that we do and say. So rise now as you are able in body and spirit as we sing to our merciful God. For this day for this is a day that you have made and we rejoice and we're glad to be in it so now be with us on this day as we come to you and worship and we worship you through your son jesus the christ amen, amen. amen. you may be seated good morning and welcome to worship at milwaukee metropolitan community church for all of you who are here this morning welcome and those of you who are worshiping with us online we uh, welcome you as well we invite you to click the like button or put a comment in the comments box so we know that you're worshiping with us this morning um, a little abundance of announcements this morning because we're getting into that busy time of the year for the church um, our stewardship campaign is uh, plugging right along if you haven't uh, filled out your steward your pledge card for stewardship I uh, encourage you to uh, pray about doing that and and turning those in hopefully between now and the, the next few weeks uh, we're gonna take stewardship into November um, but we uh, just start thought we'd start in October with all the festivities happening in November our um, annual meeting will be on Sunday the 14th of November the second Sunday um, we are um, having board positions open. If you are interested in running for the board, um, please see a board member or myself for an application and we can get you that information. Today is Pack the Pantry and I saw that lots of folks were bringing stuff for the pantry, which is great. Um, we do that every fourth Sunday of the month where we help keep the pantries stocked at Vibrant Health and also with uh, Courage Milwaukee. And then also, is our Winter Madness Clothing Drive, which I also saw a lot of stuff coming in for the kids this morning. So we're doing that between now and the end of this month. Uh, we're getting socks and mittens and the hand warmers and all the stuff to help keep our homeless and uh, LGBT kids who are on the streets warm this winter so you can bring that. Today, um, if you're ordering script, is the deadline for script for this month. Uh, script forms are out in the narthex if you need one. Um, you can fill one out and give it to a board member or myself. Um, we will uh, order that and have it for next week. So the third weekend in November, the 19th through the 24th, is our network gathering. Um, it is open to all MCC folk, not just the board and the lay delegates and the pastors. Um, we come together once a year with all of our sister churches and we are gathering here in Milwaukee this year. Um, we will uh, start on Friday the 19th. We'll actually start here um, and then through the weekend and then Saturday and Sunday we'll be out at American Family Field for uh, festivities there as well as worship that Sunday. And then on Saturday, 
is our annual fundraiser that we have every year, a night of cabaret. Um, we are looking for volunteers to help with the weekend as well as that night. You can see uh, David or any board member um, in regards to your help with that. Um, we are gonna need lots of hands because we are doing it, um, as we said, at American Family Field in the Sky Lounge. Um, it's a new venue for us this year, so we are looking forward to having all that be good, and I think it'll be a great event with all of our other folks. And then on Sunday, we will have our 50th anniversary worship celebration at the same place in the Sky Lounge um, with all of our uh, fellow MCC folks and all those in the community to celebrate uh, 50 years of existence here. And we also will be um, celebrating 35 years for Angels of Hope. Um, both of us share the same anniversary date of November 30th. But um, of course we do it a little bit earlier because of weather restrictions. Um, but that will be a great Sunday. Um, I will tell you that we um, have a few, um, I guess, surprises uh, for that Sunday. Um, good surprises. Um, we uh, will be honoring a couple of our former uh, clergy, who um, some who are no longer with us, some who are with us. Um, so you, you don't want to miss that. It's going to be a, a great Sunday. And then afterwards we have our brunch and it will be there at uh, the same location um, and that with that um, information and flyers and order forms are all out in the narthex so if you are interested um, please do so um, I hope we can get those in soon as well so we can kind of get an idea of what we're planning for and with that let us hear God's Word our Hebrew lesson this morning comes from Malachi chapter 1 verses 6 through 11 taken from the inclusive Bible Children, honor their parents, and laborers their overseer. If I am a parent, where is the honor due to me? If I am an overseer, where is, re where is the respect due to me? Says Yahweh, omnipotent, yet your priests despise my name. How have we despised your name, you ask? By offering polluted food on my altar. How have we polluted it? you ask, by saying that Yahweh's table isn't worthy of respect. When you offer a blind animal, you say, there's nothing wrong with it. And when you offer an animal that is lame or diseased, you say, there's nothing wrong with it. If you brought such a gift to your governor, would the governor welcome you or show you favor? Says Yahweh on the pulpit. And now you please and implore God's favor. Be gracious to us. This is what you have done. Do you think God will accept any of you? Says Ali Omnipont. Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors, that you would stop lighting pointless fires on my altar. I take no pleasure in you, says Yahweh Omnipotent and I will accept no offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is honored among the nations, says Yahweh Omnipotent. May God bless the hearing of these words.
Will you please rise as you're able for the reading of the scripture? Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Malachi, chapter 3, verses 6 through 12, taken from the Inclusive Bible. No, I, Yahweh, do not change, and you, children of Jacob, are not ruined yet. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you turned aside from statutes and did not keep them. If you return to me, I will turn back to you, says Yahweh in the potent. You ask, how can we return? Dare a human being defraud God? Yet you defraud me. You ask, how have we defrauded you? In your tithes and offerings, there is a double curse on all of you, your entire nation, because you defraud me. Bring the entire tithe into the storehouse, so there be food in my house. Put me to the test, says Yahweh omnipotent, and see if I do not open windows in the sky and pour so much blessing on you that you cannot contain it. I will keep pests from destroying the produce of your soil and prevent your vines from dropping their fruit, says Yahweh omnipotent. All nations will call you happy. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. <laughs>
Will you come to prayer with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, this is the day that you have made, and we are thankful for all that you provide in our lives each and every day. Allow us to continue that gratitude in our lives and to those who we come, come in contact with in our daily lives. Allow us this morning, gracious God, to praise and honor you as we keep growing with our vision as we go into the next 50 years. Let us strive through the generosity in our midst and keep it alive. Allow us to continue to come together with one another and through the love that you provide to each and every one of us. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay and mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each of our hearts, may they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray, amen. amen. So as we continue this series called Being Generous, we get to that point in stewardship that I always consider the awkward, the weird, or the difficult topic to preach on. And if you go to a lot of churches, you probably, depending on the churches you go to, will hear a lot about money, and they talk about money. And I mean a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm not knocking those churches by any means, it's just a fact. And then there are some of those churches who go on the other end of the pendulum, clearly to the other side, and don't talk about it at all. I like to think that we fall somewhere in the middle or maybe a little bit above the middle of where we go and how we discuss stewardship and our finances within our, our congregation. Now some churches pass a plate, some use offering baskets like we do, others have those offering baskets or boxes affixed to the back wall so as you go out you put your offering in. Others have a big box right in the middle in some cultures. It's just all different ways of how we give. So the scripture lesson we heard this morning, or should I say scripture lessons, both came from Malachi, and I actually switched the readings over about Thursday night, um, mm -hmm. deciding that I wanted to, to preach on that versus what I originally was gonna preach on. But it probably is some of the toughest passages that we hear when it pertains to the finances. These are those passages that will probably get called the strongest in their reprimand that God makes to the people. It's also the strongest promise or the outcome on the back end. Now, Malachi is this Old Testament prophet, and he is speaking of God's people roughly about 400 years ago even before Jesus was in the picture. So this is where Malachi fits into this so-called timeline. If you were keeping track, but speaking, whatever, of the Jewish people, and you know that God's people in the Old Testament were the Jewish people. But God is speaking through Malachi to these people in an era where they probably are the furthest away from God, the era of the great disobedience on behalf of those people. So I want to just jump over into Matthew for a second because it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Now, if you're starting to plan for 2022 and you're looking at those things from 2021, you kind of look at it as you look at your calendar or your watch or the time, maybe through your checkbook, a spreadsheet, maybe through software, things that control your finances, whatever you use, it just shows what you have done for the year. If you truly value and honoring God, you will more than likely see that reflected. Or you are a true family, you're a true family that saves. With all that, I'm not saying that we don't save, but at the same point, there's lots of things that come into context. So if you aren't seeing intentional time or spending intentional time with God, if you're not seeing that pattern, then you should probably put up a red flag because what God is speaking about in this passage is exactly a part of the time and our treasure. You could say at this point that God is speaking to them through Malachi in the present tense, meaning God isn't implying that this will happen. Rather, he says, hey folks, this is happening right here and now. Now we're going back into Malachi, more like at the very beginning of the book, we hear right off the bat and remember that this is coming from Malachi, coming, through God, coming from God through Malachi, who is being considered the prophet. 
saying that I have loved you, says Yahweh. But you say, how have you shown your love? And not going back into it in too much in depth and summarizing a little bit, there's a man who's given God's promise, and his name was Abraham. And his son's name, Isaac, who turns and carries out God's promises and passes it on, in which he has two sons. Within that story, we have Esau and Jacob, and they are twins. And one of the sons is going to go and become the follower of God. He's going to follow God and God's people, of which they become a family and become a nation. And later through this, we'll see that God goes from a nation to the entire world. Now what happens is that there are their two brothers, and they end up, one ends up following God and the other doesn't, of course. The older one who doesn't is named Esau, and the younger one is Jacob. They become that name of Israel, and the sons become the tribes within Israel. Now, I'm sure we all know the story about the tribes, but that Esau, Edom, and his people become just a people of God, and that are persecuted through God's people. God instantly is constantly pushing them back, fighting them back, and here that God is saying that he still loves them, and yet the people are saying, well, God, how have you loved us? Well, of course, God is telling them to compare themselves to the people of Esau, who have never received God's blessing, who are always outside of God's plan, and God continues, yet in your disobedience, God says that they are loved. Now, as the people of Israel were wandering away from God, God is saying to them, hey, if you'll humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, he says that we will be heard and in our prayers that God will forgive and heal the land and heal all those within us because as God, I love you. As individuals, it's our nature to treat God differently when God is blessing us or when we need something. An example may be our finances that are not where we'd like them to be. Maybe we're in need of a job. Maybe our local income doesn't cover all of our expenses. Whatever it is, whatever we're praying, it's kind of, oh, hey, God, would you meet my needs financially? Are you one who seeks God differently? When you need something, compare it to when you are seeing of what God is providing for. Do you completely forget God and where God is coming from at times in your life? See, that's what God is saying, not only to the folks in Israel, but to everybody. It is like we're over here and pleading and that we're being told to return back over here. But at the same time, they're not listening. And then God says, when I bless you, you tend to run away. And when we get to the bottom of the barrel, we get to that lowest point in our lives, we start wailing out and all the things we're saying, we start blaming God for all of that. Now, a lot of times as humans, we laugh because that's how we are. But when we laugh, it's that we're not alone. The Bible was full of people and stories that sometimes we're crazy and sometimes we're not, just like all of us. But they were people. They were real people. If we look back into the Old Testament or the church or the temple, we're going back probably about 2,500 years and here's how giving or tithing or offering would work in the old temple or testament church. People back in the time would probably raise sheep or cattle, or they'd grow crops or food, and there were some who would trade spices and get paid in gold and silver, or whatever the money exchange was back in the day. And these people would take whatever money they had, and if they would go out to the harvester crops, they would take the first tenth, in other words, they would take the first part of that harvest and to the best part of that harvest, and they would bring it to the temple or the church. Those people who had animals, if they had 10, they'd take the first 10, but the best 10, and they would come and bring those to the church. And that would pay for the priesthood and for the people that worked there, and it would serve and lead them in worship. Now, I'm not saying next week, bring your... your livestock and your grain and all that because um, I'm not sure what I would do with it but, 
But out of all these tribes, there was one tribe, the Levites, who served full-time, and they were in vocational ministry. And so they were fully funded because the Levites didn't own land. They didn't have jobs. In other words, they were funded by the people. The people would come, they'd bring food and their grain and whatever they have, and they would give it to the church. What was happening here, and just let's, I'm going to use a lamb for an example, that they'd bring ten, ten baby lambs, and they'd look at these ten lambs and they would say, well, these are the best ones I have. I'm going to keep them for myself. And well, there's that little runt over there. The little one who's kind of woozy, kind of not looking so well, whatever. We'll give that one to God. But here's what they're really saying in their hearts. Well, I want all of these. And they'll, this one, well, I have no use for it, so we'll just give that one to God. Now, if you hear this little wimpy one over here, it's like all the wrong things with it. I mean, would you want to eat a little wimpy, old, whatever, baby lamb that isn't well <clears throat> compared to the healthy one over here? Of course not. But that might be lunch later on. So, you know, when you go basically go buy Euros R Us, you may get a lamb sandwich, you know, you know not knowing what you're going to get. But, but what we are looking at is all the gifts. There really is nothing there that you want. But at the same time, you're saying if you raise cattle or sheep, that the one you don't want is the one that you don't want to breed and the one that you can't sell. So we'll just give that leftover piece over here to God. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit into the modern world. We all have our incomes. We all get paid. We get our paychecks, whether it's monthly, weekly, however we get it. And it's like, I have to pay the mortgage. I have to pay for the technology that I use, my cell phones and my internet and all that. We have to eat. Oh, and I have to make the car payment. Oh, and I have to do this. Well, here's what's left. I guess I'll give that to God. Same theory. That's what's happening. And now that's that difference of what God has called them to do, but what they are doing. And this is that scenario that overflows from the top. It's not just of it. That God is saying, if I was human, would you treat me better? And yet God, I'm God, and you're giving me what is left over. And not even the leftovers, it's really below that. You're giving me the bottom of the barrel. I mean, no one wants this. You can't eat or breed it or even sell it. There's this moldy food that you've got in the back of your refrigerator. God knows how long it's been sitting there mm. that needs to be thrown out. And you're kind of like, oh, well, we'll just give that. That's not our tithing or offering. Tithing or treasures is this concept or idea. Tithing in both the Old Testament and the New Testament has a few principles. Tithe actually means the first tenth. Tithe literally means one-tenth when you define it. The principle of one-tenth is meaning the first fruits or giving our best. So the harvest comes in, the first part of the harvest, and we know that back then, that first part of the harvest was at the time of Pentecost. It was part of that Jewish culture where there was the feast of the first fruits and the grains. Now we heard in the scripture of Malachi this morning saying that when you offer a blind animal, you say there's nothing wrong with it. And when you offer an animal that is lame or diseased, you say there is nothing wrong with it. If you brought such a gift to your governor, would that governor welcome you or show you favor? So what's being said here is exactly the opposite of what tithing is. Now keep in mind that they're still giving they're still probably giving a percentage of that giving, and these people are actually speaking with God. Now, they're giving, but they're not just giving in the way that God has called them to give. They're not giving in the way that is sacrificial. They're not giving in a faith-based way. They're not even giving the way as God has called them to do. And at the same time, they're not being obedient to what God is asking them to do. <coughs> So what God is really saying is that whoever causes rain to fall on our crops and when we get up to that harvest, we put our breath in our lungs and then we let out all of that and we take those percentages and start dividing them the right way. 
I think our gifts of income that are given by God is like our talents or our health or how we do that. There is no guarantee in our lives of what we are given by God. But God is calling us to be good stewards with everything that we have. Every part of our financial percentage, our, our giving percentage, our talents, and our, all of the things that come with that, even our time. Now, none of us like being in debt, and none of us live with that. And it's like, how do you live within your means? How do you save for the future for all those things? At the same time, how do you come along and have financial peace in your life? Well, I'm going to say that there is things, something out there called financial peace. And it's a, it's a program that <clears throat> kind of puts you into a spiritual mindset of how you deal with your finances and with your living, and, and not just with your finances, but everything in your life. I think sometimes we get asked the question, is it money or is it God? Christians believe that God... Christians believe in God, but often trust in money. Money shows us where our heart is. Another question that comes up is, do our finances come before God, but what does it reveal? What happens when we put other things first? What do we truly say about our worship with God when we do that? It's saying either that we don't believe when God tells us, or we don't trust when God provides for us. And that's just outright of how we are. It's a challenge that comes with our lives. We say that we believe in God, but then we tend to trust in the mighty dollar. As I said earlier, the biggest rebuke in God of all the scriptures comes out of this scripture. We hear God say, here's how you're giving to me. God is saying, you're giving me what is left over and what you can't do or anything else. You're giving me stuff that wouldn't be given to another human being because they wouldn't take it. But God continues to say that that we'll still be prayed for with everything in our life. God is saying that this is how you treat me. Now, we need to listen because sometimes we don't hear. It's that very promise from God over a thousand years ago that God continues to tell us that God has not changed but also saying that through Jesus that he would come and that the 2400 years or 2500 years ago to Malachi, that it's all coming back and we have, we have heard the same note of that, nothing has changed. God has not changed God's ways in all of existence. But there are promises that we still are required to have in our lives and that we give. So it's kind of like, I get to contribute this. I want to get a piece of this. I get to be obedient or I not, but God still doesn't change. God promises us to, to these things and God promises these commands. Maybe we don't bring sheep or wheat or whatever, but it's always that piece of the puzzle that is mystery that is given through all of this. Now it's maybe making sense, maybe not making sense, but God still isn't chasing. God per repeatedly says the same thing. Here it is, if I was the parent, where is my honor if, if I was the master? If I was the master, where is the obedience? Yet we continue to ask how we have not obeyed God by bringing in the leftovers and giving what was left. Now, all through this, God slips in and returns all of this and remembering all this. But it says, return to me and I will return to you. That's God's promise. God was calling these people to be good stewards of what God has noticed within them and that they have nothing, but takes note that they're giving, that they're giving what they can't use. You see, stewardship is taking care of something that belongs to someone else. God starts from the premise that God has given us everything we have. Therefore, all of our resources of God, our time, our talent, our treasures, all become the good stewards that we are. But how do we return and how do I as an individual return to God? So we heard in the second part of Malachi this morning that we bring our entire tithe into the storehouse so there will be food in my house. Put me to the test says Yahweh, and see that I do not 
open windows in the sky, or pour as much blessings on you that you cannot contain. So as we're all praying and discerning over our 2022 of wherever we are, I would hope that we are saying, how can I be better as a Christian or better as a steward in my own life? Whether it's my finances to the church or my finances of my own life. But yet the piece of the puzzle is this message that is giving us that God is clearly saying, test me. Now, some of you who know the Bible and know all of this might be scratching your head and saying that we're being clearly asked to be test, to, to test God. But we're, throughout the entire Bible, we're instructed not to test God. This is that one exception. It's that one pass that you get. In all the Bible where it clearly says a hundred times over, God does not get tested, but here we get to test God. This is the only place that says, test me, and gives you that challenge. I can probably clearly say safe this morning that each and every one of us go through struggles with what God tells us. Strugglings in what we do and our promises and all of that. But God still tells us, test me, try me, see what happens. So here's the challenge. God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and that we're called to test God by tithing, which challenges us to live on less than what we bring in, which probably already doesn't seem like enough. We probably feel like we have more than we have and that we're meaning that we feel like we don't have enough, but yet we're being called at the same time to live and probably to live probably off of 80% of our earnings. Now, if you haven't figured it out, God is calling us to live beyond, excuse me, below our means, and more likely, more past that, even double beyond our means. We need to take a change of heart. We need to look at the important things and approach things in a different way, more or less like what we do. Do we idolize things or do we not? So where do we begin? How do we take the first steps of where we are? Maybe we may be giving for the first time. Maybe you're a regular giver. Maybe you give a percentage. Maybe you don't. It's all the different categories that we have. We're all at different stages when it comes to our giving. And But when it comes to all of this, as I bring this kind of to a, a wrap, I'm going to say that we need to continue to discern. We continue to continue to pray where we are in our giving, not only to the church, but to everything else in our lives. Maybe we need to find a new starting point. Maybe we need to look back at the beginning of how we go through our lives with all of our finances, whether it's paying the mortgage or paying this or paying that. But I'm going to challenge you that whatever that starting point is in your life, Maybe make it a little uncomfortable. And don't base it looking at your budget, but base it looking at God. Because when God says, listen, test me, see if it is by doing it. If the other windows haven't poured out your blessings until you need more. So our challenge is to look beyond, look beyond our limits to see where we can go. So that's my challenge to you this morning. So as we continue with stewardship to look and to pray and to discern of everything that comes within your life. Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take a minute before I get into the offering to talk about the gala and the Sunday worship that we will be having at American Family Field. So in trying to plan this, my head spins, <laughs> in trying to figure things, so then I call pastor and then we talk and then both of our heads are spinning and so we have a commitment that we have to pay for the venue. We have, that comes with a commitment that we will spend a certain dollar amount between food and beverage. Um, and um, when you do these venues, they do not move a table from here to there without charging you for it. So you have to think we need the tables and chairs for people to sit at at the event. We need the tables to set up for the silent auction. We need the tables for checking you in when you get there. Um, we're having some cool things this year. You're going to get a swag bag, um, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. So there'll be a table in back where those bags are set up. 
And so when you start, you have to look at, well, how many people are coming, right? Because you don't, unless you're my mother, which bad habit I got when I cook, I end up cooking for 50, whether there's 20 people coming or not. But to pay for that much food, if we don't have that many people coming, becomes, uh, you know, a big deal. We don't want tons of leftover wasted food either. So, so this year we have um, decided on top of what you've already seen of table sponsors and people coming in, we're going out to the community, to businesses and, and community places and trying to raise some additional funds. So we have some things and this will be by Monday on the website and I have some hard copies for, for you. Um, we have things this year like a venue sponsor, um, the alcohol bar sponsor because um, people who have bought tickets get at least one drink coupon to come so we have to cover the cost of that. If you drink more than that you're, it's a cash bar but we have the swag bags which will have the church logo on one side and if we can find someone to sponsor it early enough their logo will be on the other side of the bag. Um, we're going to have a photo booth so if you have dressed up to come to this event you'll be able to take a photo with who's ever there um, and we'll get you um, copies of those those pictures. A media sponsor, the silent auction sponsor to help cover the tables and the moving of the tables and then an after party sponsor so it'll hopefully be a bar where those of you who want to continue after the event to go somewhere that will all gather at, at the same place. In addition to that within that swag bag people can advertise and this is where you really come into play. So if you've gotten things before like you know give now because we have somebody who's matching we did that here with the building fund one time you know for for every dollar you give somebody's matching your money or doubling the match or whatever I need you to think of this event the same way so if we can put this event on the way we want to and have all these things sponsored then if you give a hundred dollars towards that we put it on, we get more people there, more people are buying silent auction items, and we raise more money. So whatever we give up front, we're hoping to be able to double that, triple that, and that all comes from what you can do. Now that doesn't mean you have to do it out of your pocket. So the advertisement is, if you have your heating and furnace people, and you see that they advertise someplace, see if they're willing to spend the $200 to put a full size sheet inside that swag bag. If they do that, they can also put their cozy, they can put their keychain, they can put whatever sort of giveaway things they have for that business in that bag. It says $200 on here. I'm telling you that if you know somebody and they're a good customer and they say, or a good you know, vendor for you or somebody that helps you out around the house, if they say that's too expensive, then give them a half page for $100. Okay, because all of that adds up. It keeps the event um, within reason for costs for us to come. We're charging you $20 for breakfast on Sunday, which will be a buffet breakfast. It's going to cost us more than $20 a person, but whatever we can raise. In addition, there's a booklet that's going to be the night of the event that will have the program and things in, and people can also get a half page ad in there for $50. So that might be another church that might be somebody who just wants to put an ad in that says congratulations Milwaukee MCC on your 50 year. So we're asking all of you to get involved in this. Think about it. Think about the people you know. We try to keep the prices reasonable. It's a chance for them to advertise. It's a chance for them to put some stuff in. Put an ad in the booklet if they can't handle that higher level of sponsorship. But it would be helpful for all of us to do it. So you can see me, I have some hard copies, or like I said, on Monday, it should be on the web. So we'd like it to be a great event. We'd like it to be low enough cost that people can come to the event and have the food and the rest of the stuff and have a good time, but yet raise crucial funds for the church. So, all right, time of offering your green cards. If you haven't filled it out already, please do so or hand it to one of us after service. Mm -hmm. On the back of the green card, um, please give us your prayer request. 
updates to any re prior requests you have so we can update. Um, sometimes it kind of seems like we just talk about prayer requests. I really, you know, even for myself, sometimes I, if I don't like think about it or put a reminder in my phone to do it, to actually spend some time and pray for those prayer requests. So if you don't have the sheet in front of you to just generally pray for those things that are um, requested by members of this congregation for their loved ones, their family, their friends, that we do take some time and actually pray. We're not just putting it on a card. The purpose of the prayer request is that we all pray for those things that are on the card. Stewardship. I'm pushing buttons. <laughs> Too many things in my hand. Um, when I was in college, and don't know that I'm going to do this justice, so um, the church that I went to was pretty close to campus and it was filled with a lot of students. So you can imagine what the offerings were like of trying to raise money to keep the, to keep the church going um, there. And I don't know if it was during stewardship, it was a sermon that really stuck in my head and maybe it was because I was a college student um, and not picking on Ben or anybody else that's in school. But the pastor talked about how you would get to Sunday morning and you would look at what was left in your pocket after the week and what you could put in the plate when it came around. And he encouraged us to go home that Sunday or whenever our money came in and put that money away at the beginning of the week and see whether or not we needed to spend it before the following Sunday. So did I really need that extra cup of coffee? Did I really need to go buy that pack of cigarettes? Did I really need to do whatever? So I had would have to physically go take that money I set aside to put in the plate next Sunday and go spend it on something so that it would help me try to figure out how important that was. And I would say at this point in my life, when the pastor gives us the message and I look at it, it's, do I need that brand new cell phone because it's the latest coolest iPhone and how do I do that how do I set that money aside and say do I need it or can I give it to the church or can I give it to some worthy charity do I need you know do I need that new winter coat this year or can I put some money towards buying socks and things for the drive that we're doing for the youth so I would encourage you to think that way <coughs> as you you know, determine what you can give on a Sunday as you fill out your pledge cards and as we do tithing every week. You know, it's not about Sunday morning figuring out what you have to put in the plate. It's about doing some planning and, and doing some, you know, thinking about your life and how you're spending your money. So. so with that, as we come to the table this day, for those of you who are worshiping with us online, if you haven't already done so, I invite you to get your communion elements so you can take part in this wonderful meal. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these gifts you provide the bread and the fruit of the vine. Let the bread we break and the cup we bless speak to us of the presence of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and all who follow Christ's way, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. It was at that moment in the evening that Christ was with the disciples and all those who gathered. And at the end of the meal, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and said to everyone to take and to eat. For this is my body that has been given for you. And each time that you eat of this, do so in remembering me. Likewise, he took the cup from the table. As he took the cup, he blessed it and he said that this is the cup of the new covenant of my life, which is poured out for all people and for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of this often, and as you often and as often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And so with the bread and the cup, we remember your word dwelling among us full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in Christ's death and resurrection and offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving and the holy living sacrifice 
in union with Christ's offering for us. Will you please pray with me? Here at this table, you gather your beloved, pouring out your spirit upon the gifts of the bread and the cup. As we are fed by the broken bread, strengthen us so we may wipe the cheeks of those stained by the tears of fear. Feed the babies of families who have no food for them. As we drink deeply of the cup of salvation, may we have the courage to challenge all who would be put in vulnerable and even in risk. Offer hope to those who find themselves forgotten by the side of the road, by those who see only their greed. And when the seeds of grace you planted at the birth of creation burst forth at the end of time, you will gather us around your table with our sisters and brothers from every moment and every place as we lift our voices and praises to you, God in community, holy and one. Amen. Amen. and every day. Let us go out through the protection and love and tender mercies that are given us each and every moment. As those mercies and love and protection are given us through God the Creator, God the Savior, God the Holy Spirit. As we go in peace, I invite you to sit and enjoy the postlude.